Jinnah was the creator of a state which never existed on the map of the world. And this is something very unique because there is hardly any example where a person could achieve a new country. The people, of course, had um, many hopes in Jinnah because he was the only leader which the Muslims had produced for a very long time who could deliver the goods. It was only this so-called westernized Muslim who somehow or the other led to some positive results, gave them a state. That is why there was such disillusionment on his death because the Muslim didn't know what to do. And it was with that spirit that the moment they learned that he has died, there was a flock and rush towards the governor's house where his body was lying. I remember because it was lying in the courtyard uh, outside the governor's house. Oh, it was massive. I've never heard so many people. Cry. I mean, mo but uh, but they, 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 in the morning and crying and thousands, uh, lakhs of people. But that was to be expected. That's very Indian, very Pakistani, both. But anywhere, or somebody like that. Remember that the Pakistan had only been going for a year or something, so it was very emotional. In Lahore, Muslims slaughtered non-Muslims. Across the new border, in Amritsar, Sikhs and Hindus killed all the Muslims they could find. Jinnah, now installed at Government House, addressed his people. August the 15th is the birthday of the independent and sovereign state of Pakistan. At this supreme moment, my thoughts are with those billion fighters in our cause who readily sacrificed all they had to make it. Pakistan, Pakistan. There was information from the Indian government that a refugee train is due to arrive. Muslim refugees from other places. And I remember twice, not once, twice. When the train compartments were opened, they were full of dead bodies. They had been slaughtered. It was a horrible sight, I can't get over it. Then these people who came on foot, you know, on horses or bullock carts or something, their breasts cut off, worms streaming down their wounds and 
In a terrible state, and when they would relate their experiences, I used to be very upset, very upset. And I thought, who wants to live in a country where you are killed because you are a Muslim? I said, nothing. I'm going. I have made up my mind. I just wanted to be out of that atmosphere. And what did you sacrifice in leaving Bhopal? All the property, that is all. The allowances, the wealth, the palaces, what more? He was not a religious man, but he wasn't irreligious either. There was no big religious thing. I asked Mr. Jinnah to say the prayers. He was a bit nervous about it because there were hundreds of thousands of people looking at him all the time. We tried to explain to him that prayer is much more important to the masses because they feel that if we are talking of a Muslim homeland, religion should come first. And that's how Mr. Jinnah accepted the position. Some mullahs were suspicious of Jinnah's new commitment to Islam. They opposed the Pakistan idea because they feared it would be un-Islamic and even issued fatwas against some League members. They thought Pakistan, when it is established, it will be a secular state like Turkey. Because all those who are supporting this movement for Pakistan, their approach, according to them, was not really purely Islamic. It was the westernized version of Islam. In other words, that Islam was safer within an undivided yes. India than it was within a Muslim state. Yes, exactly. This is what their impression was, and that's why they opposed the Pakistan movement. Much of the movement's dynamism was coming from the Muslim University at Aligarh, birthplace of the two-nation theory, and now the center of Muslim League youth activity. When I went to Aligarh, I think it was for the first time that I saw Mr. Jinnah. Tall, handsome, confident, bold. I was definitely attracted by his personality. He galvanized the Muslim masses. He awakened their consciousness and spirit. And a sense of destiny and identity. He declared that Aligarh especially was the arsenal of Muslim India. And most of us, most of the students, not only from Aligarh, but from other colleges and universities, Muslim students, were trained uh, in special camps so that they could contact each and every voter for the battle that was to be fought. Pakistan idea was spreading into the markets and mosques of Muslim India. Some young enthusiasts distributed news sheets to convince the Muslims that they were being done down by the Hindus. हम कोशिश कर रहे थे कि मुसलमानों को बताएं कि तुम्हारी जो इक्तिसादी आलत है और तुम्हारी तमाम तजारत हिंदुओं के हाथ में है जो अंग्रेज के अपने आदमी है और गरीब जो है गरीब से गरीब तर होते जा रहे हैं ये जो दिहात है छोटे-छोटे गांव में जो थे हिंदू हमारे मुसलमानों को चीजें कर्ज पे देते थे फिर जिस पर उनका फसल उठता था उस फसल में वो पैसा देते फिर उस पर सूद भी लेते थे चुनाची बहुत सी जमीनें मुसलमानों का जो है हिंदुओं ने उस कर्ज के बदले में रख लिया था तो यहां के लोगों को जो है हिंदुओं के इस अमल के खिलाफ बहुत नफरत थी बहुत शिकायत इन 1942 विद द फॉल ऑफ सिंगापुर एंड रंगून the war reached India's doorstep. The British government, desperate for India's help, sent Cabinet Minister Sir Stafford Cripps to win over Congress and the Muslim League. And we hope that the Indian leaders will give the help they have already promised us as regards the mobilization of that great people in the protection of their own country. 
In exchange for Jinnah's cooperation, Cripps conceded that any province could opt out of a future independent India. But Jinnah, now raising the stakes, rejected the offer on the grounds that Pakistan was not explicitly named. Jinnah was talking tough, but his purpose was still unclear. Did he want his Pakistan to stay within India, or to become a new separate state? In September 1944, the house on Malabar Hill was the scene of lengthy negotiations between Jinnah and Gandhi, his old adversary, who had recently been released from detention. The Mahatma journeyed to Jinnah, still hoping to persuade him back into the All India fold. I think like two stalwarts doing a case, each recognized the merit of the other and was trying to find a weakness in the point of view of the other. I think Gandhi realized that he was up against a sort of rock, as it were, who wasn't going to budge. And uh, uh, Jinnah realized he was up against a very clever fellow, which he was. And both were a match for each other. Now, for example, the famous incident where in the, in the very first day, Mr. Gandhi said, you have mesmerized the Muslims. Mr. Jinnah retorted, you have hypnotized the Hindus. But the talks got nowhere. The two men stuck to their old positions. Gandhi refused to accept that India contained two nations of Hindus and Muslims. Jinnah insisted on their separateness. Mr. Jinnah claimed that he will only represent the Muslims. And Mr. Gandhi said he's representing the whole of India. And Mr. Jinnah cornered him and says, no, you cannot, you can at the most say that you are representing the Congress. And Congress in turn represents predominantly the Hindus. It was another stumbling block in our way. Now, we couldn't uh, uh, say that Congress is a Hindu organization. It was impossible for us to say it because we were not a Hindu organization. Congress was a nationalist organization comprising of all nationalities and all communities. If I participated in the struggle for freedom, it is as an Indian, not exactly as a Muslim. The talks may have failed, but Jinnah's status was heightened simply by the Mahatma's public recognition of him. Jinnah's secretary, Sharifuddin Pirzada, was present throughout. Mr. Jinnah's point was that he will make his best efforts to convince Mr. Gandhi about the possibility of establishment of Pakistan. At least he should accept the principle. Then the details can be worked out subsequently. So Mr. Jinnah was able to project Pakistan in this way. And these talks more or less receive international notice. For Gandhi, the talks were a disaster. For Jinnah, they were an inspiration. He was now touring India, building the Muslim League as a mass movement. Whenever he visited the Punjabi capital, Lahore, he would stay among the students of Islamia College. Ishlal Zaidi was one. Once I remember, somebody from us asked a rather naive question. He said, Qaid, uh, Everybody is saying that Mr. Gandhi travels by a third-class train, but you travel by first class and you live in this huge houses and he lives very simply and he became thoughtful. But he said, uh, look, the two things, one is a leader should show himself what he is and the people must accept him what he is. I do not live in double life. Uh, there has to be a transparency. With Gandhi and Jinnah at loggerheads, the Viceroy, Lord Wavell, who believed independence was now inevitable, called a conference at the Hill Resort of Simla to discuss membership of a transitional government. Jinnah insisted that all Muslims in any such government had to be members of his Muslim League, cutting out Muslims who belonged to Congress and other parties. The talks collapsed. The political significance of it was that he wanted that whatever constitutional arrangement that Britain arrives at, it has to be, it has to have his approval and he would not give the approval unless he was recognized on the same 
level on par with, with Gandhi. That was the whole trouble with it. That is why he ridiculed the Congress Muslims like me. He, he ridiculed all those people who disagreed with him. Gandhi was not half as dictatorial as Jinnah was. Gandhi believed in carrying people with him. Jinnah sort of dictated. Power in Britain, and here are some members of the new government, the Prime Minister and Sir Stafford Cripps. The new Labour government in London promised independence for India. It decided to call elections, the first since 1937, to assess the strengths of Congress and the Muslim League. And we decided to go to the villages and small towns and gave them the message of Muslim League, that why did we want a separate homeland for the Muslims? The impact was electric, absolutely. League support was growing all the time, but Congress was blind to it. Its leaders, like Nehru, had spent the last three years of the war in prison and completely underestimated Jinnah's mass appeal. Nehru got frightfully angry, and I can see, see him now standing by his fireplace, and he started yelling at me, and he almost hit me. He said, no, you're absolutely wrong. They're just a myth. They're, not, they're nothing at all. They're just the imagination of the British. I said, I think you'll find they're not. And I talked to him for four hours, and at the end he calmed down. He said, well, maybe we will have to do something about the Muslim League. So he was just beginning to see the light. But, you see, he'd been away in jail so often, and he hadn't realised the enormous pressures that had been building up of resentment against the high-handed methods of, the co of Congress. In Karachi, he always came to stay with us because he was very friendly with my father. And my father adored him. Then on the polling day, he asked us how the voting went. And um, I was very excited. And I turned around to him and I said, it went very, very well. Main factor is, you know, I, I even put in a couple of um, fake votes. And he said to me, suddenly, the conversation ended, stony silence. And um, I said, yes, I changed burkhas, you know. Everybody wears burkhas. I said, I mean, change burkhas three times to go in and, and give. And the polling agents were all very pro us. At which he turned around and he said, I'm very sorry you did that because I have no intention of getting Pakistan on those in that way. I want it to be a fair election, and I'm sorry you've done that, and I would like you to go back and remove those three votes from the voters' list because you have no right to do it. The League won almost 90% of the Muslim vote in the elections. It was now clearly the authentic voice of Muslim nationalism. Its victory sharpened religious differences throughout North India. With a rising tension, the British government wanted to get out of India as soon as possible. Cripps returned with two other cabinet ministers to negotiate with the Indian leaders. It was known, and Wayward reported it back to London, but I'd got on very well with dinner and the Muslim League. And so uh, my specific role began as being a liaison with Jinnah, uh, because Cripps couldn't bear to be in the same room as him. Well, he had compulsion rather than charm. I mean, he makes you listen to him. Jinnah now showed, even at this late stage, that he was still far from committed to a total breakaway. On the 16th of May, 1946, the mission published its plan. It proposed a system of government which would reassure Muslims by grouping the Muslim provinces into units with a large measure of autonomy, but still remaining inside a united India. It was the last chance of avoiding partition. Everything now depended on Jinnah. Would he agree to such a plan when it meant going back on the Pakistan demand? This is, I think, one of the amazing things in history. Till May 1946, uh, for the last six years, everybody was talking about a separate homeland and Pakistan. And then Qaeda Azam, uh, in his wisdom, thought that, well, uh, we can give another trial to uh, a cabinet mission scheme because it was for a period of 10 years and we'll see how it works, which man means temporarily going back on Pakistan. There was going to be a center. And when he announced 
there was not one person who opposed this. Said, well, because Qaeda Azam has said it, so it must be the right thing to do. I was the president then of the Muslim League in Sindh. We accepted that situation and said that if there are the safeguard, we would uh, give up the idea of Pakistan and wait. If the safeguards which Mr. Jinnah had put forward were accepted, I think the masses would have accepted it. But the British offer was torpedoed, not by Jinnah, but by Congress's President Nehru, who rejected outright the scheme for the grouping of Muslim provinces. After Nehru's press conference in 1946, when he became the Congress president, replacing Azad, and he said, we will go in the Constituent Assembly unfettered. We will do what we want. And then Gina said, I can never trust these people. Even when they agree, they go back. And Sardar Patel described that on the part of Nehru as an act of emotional insanity. That was the most tragic moment in India's history. He never really wanted to, uh, to break away. You know, he, he thought India could, we, everybody could live together and come to terms with, with the, the Congress party or the Hindu government or what, whoever was going to be in charge. And uh, as history tells us, it wasn't to be. Jinnah was finally pushed over the edge. It was the defining moment. He demanded a sovereign state of Pakistan and called a Muslim League Day of Action. In unleashing the power of the masses, he was for the first time turning his back on constitutional methods as well as a united India. In Calcutta, 5,000 people were killed. And I saw for the first time what riot does to people. I saw a man, you know, in his throat cut. There was just this awful feeling of doom or, or of great disaster because people were being killed, which one had not thought would happen. And that was 1946. And that changed the whole, whole, of, the, uh, whole of the complexion of the, uh, the thing completely. He didn't like emotionalism. He didn't encourage emotionalism. That's why I don't think he'll encourage rioting, because he did want, he did make a mob into a nation. He wanted to make a mob into a nation. He did succeed three quarters of it, but the mob sort of reverted and became a mob. And I think that was a matter of great sorrow to him. Reports of the massacres inspired Prime Minister Attlee to try one last time and get Congress and the League to agree to a settlement. But the time had passed when either Nehru or Jinnah would make concessions. I am on my mission and I can tell you nothing about the present. That's all I can say. After the London conference, in a radio talk, Jinnah did say what he wanted very clearly. Hindu India and Muslim India must be separated because the two nations are entirely distinct and different and in some matters antagonistic to each other. Let me tell you some of the differences. History, culture, language, architecture, music, laws, jurisprudence, calendar, and our entire social fabric and code of life. One India is impossible realization. It will inevitably mean that the Muslim will be transferred from the domination of the British to the caste Hindu rule. But freedom must mean freedom both from the British exploitation and Hindu domination. Hundred millions of Muslims will never agree merely to a change of masters. A lawyer to the core, Jinnah had become the advocate of the Muslim cause. He now seemed on the point of winning his greatest case. But what really motivated him? Well, he had a, obviously a genuine love of uh, Muslims and his people. Um, that was without any doubt. Uh, and he, 
I'll tell you what, another thing that motivated him. He was, a, he was a lawyer brought up in England, and lawyers in England have a curious habit of believing in justice. And uh, <laughs> so he didn't want injustice done to his people, and he was going to fight for it. Jinnah's concept of Pakistan included an undivided Punjab and Bengal, but Muslims there were only a small majority. He now had to get the best he could in the empire endgame. In February 1947, Prime Minister Attlee announced the British would leave India by June the following year. With the end of British rule in sight, the Muslim League in Punjab stepped up its civil disobedience campaign. Sikhs and Hindus fought back. And the violence was then started about March 1947. So it was really the entire Muslim population. Every day they would just come out on the streets, were beaten up, they were tear gassing. But the government realized that every day the gathering and the numbers were bigger than before. Starting from Lahore, they went to the other places like Amritsar, to Rawalpindi, to Jalandhar, all the other towns. There was a danger of a complete collapse of the, of the central authority. This was, this was the danger of the situation. And, I, and the, 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 the talk about there having been a scuttle and a rush at the end is simply the reverse of the truth. The truth is that it had gone on far too long. The whole, the whole discussion, the transfer of power had been under discussion with the same leaders for nearly five years. In March 1947, the last Viceroy, Lord Louis Mountbatten, descended on India. The British and Congress had grudgingly accepted that India would have to be divided. I think under the terms of reference that Mountbatten had, partition was inevitable. We were officially required to try and revive the Cabinet Mission Plan. But the Cabinet Mission Plan was a, was a plan that involved a weak central government. And a weak central government was not going to be able to govern. If Jinnah was to have his Pakistan, Mountbatten, whose sympathies lay with Nehru, was determined it should be as small as possible. Only those districts of Bengal and Punjab, where the Muslims were in a majority, would be included. Mountbatten feared that Jinnah would reject his plan for a truncated Pakistan. But time was not on Jinnah's side. He was now 70 and not in good health. One evening after the talks, Mountbatten's chief of staff, Lord Ismay, reported that Jinnah seemed ready to take whatever he could get. But towards the end of the dinner, someone asked the question, how did the talks go? And Ismay, getting hold of a cigarette, uh, uh, a matchbox, which lay on the table for lighting cigars, and saying, today I had the impression that if I wrote Pakistan on this matchbox, Mr. Jinnah would accept it. In point of fact, the actual decision to accept the plan was made on his behalf by Mountbatten. And all he did was to nod his head, which is all he had to do. He didn't nod his head the wrong way. He nodded it in, in uh, a nodding of acceptance. And that was, that was, in fact, the actual token agreement which, which made possible the June the 3rd plan to be announced and the Government of India Act to be passed and all the rest of the transaction. We must remember that we have to take momentous decisions and handle grave issues facing us in the solution of the complex political problem of this great subcontinent inhabited by 400 million of people. I was in Bombay, my house, and he phoned and he said, we've got it. I said, got, you know, what, what's, and he said, Pakistan. I said, well, you've worked hard for it. And we had a personal conversation and that was it. On the 7th of August, 1947, Jinnah arrived in Karachi, his new capital. He was greeted by thousands of Muslims shouting, Pakistan Zindabad, long live Pakistan. The world's biggest Muslim state as yet had no government. Jinnah's first task was to build an administration out of the chaos he found in Karachi. But the strain showed, and by the time he was sworn in as Pakistan's first head of state, he was an exhausted man. The reception tied out Mr. Jinnah, 
and uh, he gradually moved from the crowd in the lawn onto the terrace and uh, said to one of us, uh, tell Mountbatten I'm tired and I'd like to leave. And so uh, Mountbatten came and uh, he said something about, uh, you know, he will uh, get used to these occasions and so on. But he didn't make an allowance for the fact none of us knew that he was ill. The newborn state was also in delicate health. Almost immediately, relations with India were poisoned by the conflict over Kashmir. At partition, the state's Hindu Maharaja had wanted to accede to India, but conscious of the pro-Pakistan wishes of his overwhelmingly Muslim people, he refused to commit himself. A self-governing Azad Kashmir was declared when Muslims in the west of the state took matters into their own hands. In October 1947, 5,000 armed Pakistani tribesmen entered Kashmir to defend them from attacks by state troops. Two days later, the Maharaja declared for India and called for its military support. Jinnah flew to Lahore to discuss the crisis with Mountbatten. Mountbatten's attitude to the Kashmir crisis was that it was a, a terrifying development, that the two, that having achieved a settlement which had the great advantage of, of allowing both countries to enjoy status in the British Commonwealth, it would be a terrible thing if two Commonwealth countries were at war with each other within three months of getting their own power. I have a feeling that his body clock had told him that he was going. But he wanted to prolong it as much as he could to see Pakistan firmly on its feet. And I have no doubt those four months in Quetta and Ziara did prolong his life. I think he was much more relaxed. He wasn't burdened with affairs of the state to the same degree as he was in Karachi. And he knew that he must recoup so as to give some more time of his life to the state that he had founded. We were informed that uh, Jinnah was very poorly. And uh, I, I, and also Bob Harrison, who was a pilot, uh, approached the naval aide-de-camp and said, please, if you possibly can, arrange for Jenner to get aboard the aircraft as soon as possible. It's, it's going to be very bumpy indeed later in the day. We drove down in the ambulance to the, to the airstrip. There was no airport. And we took him out. And as we were carrying the stretcher, I remember Mazar was on one side and I was on the other. A gust of wind came and blew this white sheet on his face. He moved the sheet away. As he neared the doorway of the plane, the crew had lined up. They gave a salute and he returned it with his hand. So he was very much, he had all his faculties intact. He was helped aboard and directly he arrived in the saloon. They converted two of the easy armchairs to a bed and he then uh, rested in that bed. We took off at 10 past two in the afternoon, which is one of the worst times for turbulence. Flying over terrain which was rugged, up to 5,000 feet, and there was, we had all the heat of the day causing turbulence. So I went to the door leading to the saloon, and as it so happened, I was looking directly at Jenner as he was propped up on his pillows. And he could obviously see the concern on my face because he gave me the most wonderful smile, uh, a smile I shall never forget. And it was a smile that said, don't be concerned, all is well, and all will be well. Got there six six thirty. We put him in a little room on the ground floor. You know there was so much happening. People were coming in and going out, and uh, I think the doctor came in. One of these two, uh, either Doctor Haibach or Doctor Mystery, and uh, they just threw their stethoscopes on the sofa and slumped back. 
So I sensed it and I got up, walked out and I went in and I saw, yes, they had covered his face. And Miss Jinnah was weeping, sitting beside him. While Jinnah repeatedly stressed that Pakistan should be based on Islamic principles, in a speech to the new Constituent Assembly, he'd indicated what sort of state he'd really wanted to create. Tolerant in his interpretation of Islam, he seemed also to reveal his old liberalism, as well as his lifelong concern for the rights of all. You may belong to any religion or caste or creed. That has nothing to do with the business of the state. You will find that in course of time, Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims. Not in the religious sense, because that is the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense, as citizens of the state. I'm 
Hey, I'm the. 